Hey everyone, and welcome to the Boost Your Biology podcast. My name is Lucas, and I am the founder of Ergogenic Health. Together in this podcast series, we will go underground to explore cutting edge health and human performance insights that you simply cannot search on Google to help you upgrade your existence. So without any further ado, let's jump into today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Boost Your Biology podcast. On today's show, I have a brilliant guest that will help to explore diabetes, insulin resistance, energy, and vitality. Cyrus Kambata, welcome to the show. Thanks a ton, Lucas. It's great to be here, and I appreciate the invitation to share some knowledge. Awesome. So maybe, Cyrus, you want to let my listeners know a little bit about your story and how you got so fascinated into, I guess, optimizing human health. For sure. Yeah. So I grew up in Palo Alto and California. This is like back in the eighties. And my mom told me back in the day that I was so active. She didn't know what to do with me. So, you know, typical, you know, three-year-old, five-year-old kid, just kind of like running circles, you know, breaking windows and like throwing balls and stuff. And she told me, she was like, listen, I just had to enroll you in every sport I could possibly enroll you in just to get you tired so that you'd come home and you'd actually be obedient. And I was like, cool, sweet. That's not good. Right. So from a very young age, I just was kind of like a little bit of a hellcat. And that kind of continued all throughout my uh, teenage years and then, you know, high school years and college years. And um, by the time I got to my senior year of college, this was at Stanford University. It was uh, the year 2002. I was 22 years old at that time. And all of a sudden I started to notice that, like, I felt slow. Like, I felt slow mentally. I felt slow physically. And my energy levels were just tanking. I didn't understand what was going on. So I was actually studying for finals. This is like November of 2022. And I was just trying to like get through, it was actually heat transfer as part of the mechanical engineering protocol and like not an easy subject by any stretch of imagination. So I'm sitting there trying to do all this thermodynamics. And I just recognized that I was like, oh my God, I am so thirsty. This is unbelievable. So I went and I grabbed a glass of water and I drank a full glass of water, put it down. Five minutes later, all of a sudden I was like, I think I'm thirstier. And then I would get another glass of water. And this process just kept on repeating over and over and over again. So I was drinking water, glass after glass after glass. And then I was like, you know what? Now I have to urinate. So I'd go to the bathroom every 30 minutes, like clockwork. And I was just like urinating very frequently. And then what would end up happening was that I would go to sleep and uh, I would cramp up very, you know, you get those cramps in your hamstring all of a sudden. And then you'd like try and relieve the stress. And then what would happen is that I get a cramp in my right hamstring. Then I would try and relieve the stress and it would cause a cramp in my abdomen, which would then cause a cramp in my left calf muscle. When there were moments where I was literally lying in full body, what felt like full body rigor mortis, where I was like, what is wrong with me? I don't understand. Right. So I picked up the phone. I called my sister, who's a doctor of osteopathy and family practice. And I said, Hey, Shanaz, can you explain to me what is happening? And I gave her all the symptomology and she started crying immediately. She was like, Cyrus, stop everything you're doing. Type one diabetes, go to the doctor right now. And I was like, diabetes. What are you talking about? I'm a, I'm a healthy guy. I'm normal weight. You know, what, what does that mean? Right. I literally thought at that time that like diabetes was literally for old people who ate a lot of cake. That was it. So I didn't understand what she was trying to say at the time. She's like, I don't have time to explain. Just go to the doctor. So I go straight to the health center. I check myself in and they test my blood glucose because they knew the symptomology as well. And they come back with a blood glucose reading of 660. What? Yeah. So blood glucose is supposed to be between somewhere around 80 and 130 on a daily basis, you know, somewhere fluctuating there in the non-diabetic state. And I didn't know any of this, right? She comes back and she goes, she literally looks at me. She goes, how did you get here? And I was like, I walked. And she was like, we need to get you to the ER right now. And I was like, can somebody please explain to me what is happening? And she's like, you are in what's called DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. Your blood glucose is extremely high. Your pancreas is not manufacturing insulin the way it used to. And as a result of that, you likely have type one diabetes. We have to go. So I was like, whoa, go to the hospital, 24 hours of supervision. They bring my blood glucose down with a drip irrigation of insulin. They also gave me an IV of saline so I could get more hydrated. And 24 hours later, I got discharged from the hospital with a blood glucose meter, a prescription for two different types of insulin, syringes, test strips, a carbohydrate counting guide, and a whole bunch of fear. And I was like, I think I just turned into a chronic disease patient overnight. What happened to me? But in addition to that, the doctors also diagnosed me with two other autoimmune conditions. So I actually ended up with three autoimmune diagnoses within 24 hours. Number one, Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. Number two, 
alopecia universalis, which is basically why you, you can see I have no hair. I have no eyebrows, no eyelashes, nothing. I used to have hair and it, it just fell out. And then number three, type one diabetes, autoimmune, autoimmune, autoimmune. And I was like, oh, wow. Did, did I, am I doing something wrong? Like, am, am I drinking too much alcohol? Am I smoking too much weed? Like what is happening here? I don't understand. Right. So long story short, I ended up following the recommendations of my medical team at that time. And they said, listen, eat a low carbohydrate diet, because that's the way that you can control your blood glucose and prevent yourself from using a lot more insulin into the future. And I was like, okay, great. Sounds like a plan. You're telling me I'm a, I'm a young guy. I'm athletic. I go to the gym. I play soccer. I like to eat red meat and white meat and fish and chicken and dairy products. So I'm just going to do more of that. And if that's a low carbohydrate diet, yes, I can avoid fruits and potatoes and pastas and bread. Not a big deal. So I followed that advice and I actually thought it was pretty good advice. And I was like, you're telling me exactly what I want to hear. I'm going to go do that. And about, you know, six months into the process, nine months into the process, I was like, this doesn't feel right. Like I thought I had low energy to begin with when I was first diagnosed, but then my energy levels went even lower and I recognized that my muscles just did not feel normal. I would go and I'd play a game of soccer. And instead of taking 24 hours to recover, which is normal, it would take me four days to recover. And I would go, you know, soccer is primarily lower body. So you're using your calf muscles, your hamstrings, your quadriceps, you name it, your hip flexors. But my chest would get sore. My abdomen would get sore. And I was like, something's not right here. So in addition to that, my blood glucose became very hard to control. And it kind of felt like I was on this ping pong, like a yo-yo. And uh, it almost felt like my blood glucose meter was a random number generator. Uh, it doesn't matter what time of the day, you know, I check my glucose. I could be at 110 or I could be at a 310. I could be at a 45, which is a dangerously hypoglycemic event, or I could be at a 245. And I was just like, man, why is this so hard? Like I'm literally following the advice of my medical team. I'm eating a low carbohydrate diet. I'm exercising regularly. I'm trying to keep my stress levels low. I'm sleeping. But yet, despite that glucose, hard to control. And my insulin use doubled in the first year. So I went from using 25 units of insulin all the way upwards of 50. And I was like, this is not working. I don't understand. So I switched my diet. I started talking to people and I said, Hey, do you know anybody with type one diabetes? Can you help me out? What's another way that I can, you know, eat? What's a different philosophy I can follow that might help me feel less crappy. And I got my mind open to this idea that if I became a plant-based eater, that all of a sudden things could change for the better. And I never wanted to be a plant-based eater. I never, I used to make fun of people who were eating vegetarian diets when I was younger, but I was like, whatever, you know, I don't really care. As long as you make me healthier then great, I'll go do that. So I switched over to becoming a hundred percent plant-based eater in the year 2003, one year after I got diagnosed. And when I made that transition, boom, my life got lit on fire. And, and I do really mean that. It felt like I was an iPhone and I was running really low on my battery and I just plugged myself into the wall. And all of a sudden I was like back mm -hmm. a lot of energy. I could exercise very frequently. My blood glucose became extremely controllable. My insulin use came back down from 50 units down to about 26 units per day. I was more hydrated. I could sleep better. The anxiety, which I had developed kind of seemed to fade away into the background. And I was like, this feels awesome. Right. So I put myself back to graduate school and I was like, you know what? I want to learn the actual science of this because just being an N of one story is cool, but it's not enough. I want to know, like, am I some kind of weird genetic freak or is there an actual story, which is really interesting underneath here that can explain the biology. And if so, let me go learn what that biology is. So I went to UC Berkeley for five years. I got a PhD in nutritional biochemistry. And while I was there, I studied to try and understand what is the thing that controls blood glucose? Is it all about sugar? Is it all about bread? Is it all about, you know, potatoes or is there something more complex? And while I was there, I got to really delve into understanding what this thing called insulin resistance is, which is now a pretty big deal. And uh, it really helped me understand what are the things that cause insulin resistance and what can you do to reverse insulin resistance and make it such that you are, you know, living with optimal blood glucose control, regardless of the type of diabetes you're living with you know, type one, type 1.5, pre-diabetes type two, or even if you don't have diabetes at all. Mm. So that leads me to today. I co-founded a business called Mastering Diabetes with my co-founder, Robbie Barbero. And the two of us, you know, we teach people with all forms of diabetes, how to transition to a plant-based diet and get the most out of life. Incredible story, Cyrus. I can't believe um, like that transition that you made. I'd love to sort of unpack that with my audience and let's sort of maybe dive deep into 
First of all, what do you think were the major mechanisms of action, you know, as far as like transitioning over from that diet that you won previously? Like, what do you think? Was it the fact that it was a, uh, you then also lowered your fat intake? So let's talk about that transition. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So as you probably know yourself and your listeners also probably know the same thing, which is that if I walked out on the street right now and I went and I asked a hundred people, what causes diabetes? And then I wrote down their answers on a piece of paper. Most of the answers would say something like sugar or carbs. Those are the two things that would pop up most frequently. People would say sugar, carbs, which is a term I don't actually like, or carbohydrate, right? And you'd see this over and over and over and over again, right? So when I went into studying uh, nutritional biochemistry, I also had that preconceived notion that like diabetes is a condition that is primarily affected by your intake of carbohydrate. But when I was first studying towards my thesis, this is the year 2000 and 2007, my um, PhD advisor came to me and he said, you know what? I want you to investigate. I want you to pull up every paper you can possibly find about how to create insulin resistance inside of laboratory mice. We're going to start there. You're going to create insulin resistance in these mice, and then you're going to rescue insulin resistance in these mice. And uh, we're going to figure out how you can rescue it most effectively. I was like, great. Sounds like a plan. So I started doing a lot of the digging to try and figure out, well, okay, how do I create insulin resistance? And in my head, I was like, okay, it's very simple. Probably you just feed them white table sugar or high fructose corn syrup. And uh, you do that in large quantities and then boom, they should develop this thing called insulin resistance, which will then progress into diabetes if you continue it. But what I found was actually totally different. And that if you look up all the you know, scientific research of how you actually induce insulin resistance in mice and rats, the entire story was about lipids and excess fat consumption, excess fatty acids. And I was like, huh, why, why is it all about lipids, lipid overconsumption? Why is it about saturated fat intake? Why is it about excess, uh, excess saturated fat and excess fat in general? This is very interesting. So to answer your question, when I switched over from eating a low carbohydrate diet to a plant-based diet, what I was instructed to do was eat as much fruit and vegetable material as I possibly could and minimize or completely eliminate all animal foods, all animal products. So I was like, okay, that sounds like a, a fun experiment. Let me see what this does. So I switched over from eating low carbohydrate foods, which like we said earlier, red meat, white meat, turkey burgers, avocados, peanut butter, cheese, milk, things of, uh, you know, that come primarily from like animals to literally fruits and vegetables. I would eat mangoes. I would eat papayas. I would eat bananas. I'd have tomatoes. I'd have broccoli. You name it. Just like that was, that was all I was eating. Yeah. But what I didn't realize at the time was that not only did I make the, the transition from animal to plant, but I made the transition from high fat to low fat, right? If I, when I, when I went through and I actually documented the foods that I was eating previously, and I took a look at my macronutrient distribution, it was 42% carbohydrate, 42% fat, and 16% protein, 42, 42, 16. And I was like, okay, cool. That's like, you know, that's like a, a medium carbohydrate diet, you know, and uh, that's like a medium fat diet and it's a medium protein diet. Okay. So it seems like relatively balanced, but that's actually very similar to the, the macronutrient composition of this, the quote unquote standard American diet. When I switched over to eating nothing but fruits and vegetables, my macronutrient distribution changed drastically. It went from 42, 42, 16 to 70 15, 15. So I went to eating 70% of my total intake, my total calorie intake as carbohydrate, 15% as fat and 15% as protein. And I was like, huh, very interesting. So my protein intake didn't actually change because it went from 16 to 15%. So we'll call it about even, but I literally traded fat for carbohydrate. And by making that trade from fat to carbohydrate, that enabled me to accomplish two things primarily as far as blood glucose is concerned. Number one, my blood glucose became very controllable. So I went from being pretty unpredictable with an average blood glucose of like 160 down to having an average blood glucose sub 100 every day, pretty much all day long. But the beauty was that I was able to accomplish that while using 40% less insulin on a daily basis. And that was the kicker to me. Cause I was like, wait a minute, what the doctors had told me and what the internet says is that if you eat more carbohydrate, then you will need more insulin, right? That's the predominant message. Even today in 2022, that's what people are saying. 
more carbohydrate equals more insulin. But what I was doing was more carbohydrate and simultaneously less saturated fat and less saturated fat equals less insulin. Right. So from a biological mechanistic per perspective, when I went back to the research and tried to understand, well, well, what is the connection here between dietary fat and, you know, high blood glucose? What I came to learn was something that was very fascinating, which is that the consumption of excess saturated fat in particular gets stored in two different tissues in your muscle and your liver, causing what's called intramyocellular lipid accumulation and intrahepatic lipid accumulation. That's just, you know, scientific words for muscle that accumulates, I'm sorry, fat that accumulates inside of muscle and fat that accumulates inside of liver, right? So the simple way to think about this is that when you consume fat in food, you consume fat in the form of triglyceride. Triglyceride is literally a glycerol molecule that has three fatty acids attached to it. Okay. So you eat triglyceride, whether that comes from animal products or even when it comes from plant products, most of the fat in the world that you consume is already locked up as a triglyceride. You consume that the triglycerides are in a sea of carbohydrate and or fiber and or protein and or cholesterol, vitamins, minerals, fiber, water, antioxidants, you name it, everything. There's a whole collection of that. But the triglyceride molecules in particular, they end up going in your mouth, travel down your esophagus into your stomach. In your stomach, they start to get partially processed and, and then eventually they get inside of your small intestine where the glycerol molecule and the fatty acids are ripped apart from each other. So the fatty acids then are absorbed through the walls of your small intestine. They get inside of these things called chylomicron particles the chylomicron particles circulate and they're little spaceships that are responsible for delivering fatty acids to tissues. The question is where are they going to put those fatty acid molecules? Mm. The three primary targets for fatty acids from the chylomicrons is number one, adipose tissue, your fat tissue. Number two, your muscle. Number three, your liver. Okay. So in an ideal world, if there's a lot of fat that you're consuming on a daily basis, then what really should happen from a biological and enzymatic perspective is that the majority of that those triglycerides, the fatty acids should actually go directly to your adipose tissue. And most people think that like, oh, adipose fat tissue is bad for me because it's going to get larger and larger over time. And then I'm going to become fat. And the truth is that, yeah, that adipose tissue can certainly expand, but the adipose tissue is actually a very safe place to store fatty acids because from a mechanical perspective and an enzymatic perspective, that's where fatty acids are supposed to be, especially for the long term. They're, they're specifically designed to be able to absorb fatty acids from the blood and hold on to those fatty acids, lock them back up into triglycerides and hold on to them for days, weeks, or months at a time. So that's actually the right place to put them. But what ends up happening is that when you eat a high fat diet, the fat ends up going inside of the adipose tissue where it's supposed to be, but then there's a spillover and the spillover goes inside of your muscle and it goes inside of your liver. So now you're accumulating fat inside of your liver and muscle and your liver and muscle are like, okay, great. I'm getting this, this, this fatty acid energy what am I going to do with it? So the liver stores some of those fatty acids and tries to burn it simultaneously. The muscles tries to store it and burn it simultaneously. And when you're eating a high fat diet in a high fat ecosystem, what ends up happening is that there's a net accumulation of fatty acids inside of your liver and inside of your muscle, because the amount that comes in exceeds the ability of both tissues to burn it. So there's more fatty acids that are coming in than fatty acids that are getting oxidized. So as a result of that, both of those tissues end up accumulating in cells, they end up accumulating in what's called the lipid droplet. So the lipid droplet starts to grow and grow and grow, get larger and larger. Now the biochemistry shows, and there's some actually fascinating research that's been uncovered by Dr. Jared Shulman over at Yale university, plus a whole collection of his colleagues that show over and over and over again, that when you grow that lipid droplet inside of muscle tissue or inside of liver tissue, there's downstream byproducts of that lipid droplet. And those downstream byproducts include notably number one called DAG, diacylglycerol, which is effectively glycerol with two fatty acids, not three. And then another thing called ceramid and diacylglycerol and ceramid are, if you can think of them as being like, you know, unwanted byproducts of a lipid accumulation. And those things then feed back on the insulin receptor and they go and they actually cause a post-translational modification, AKA they change the conformation, the shape of the insulin receptor from the inside. And as a result of that, the insulin receptor becomes less effective. Wow. And if you think about it from a biological perspective, you're like, well, why would that happen? What is the point? Why would fat then tell the insulin receptor to actually stop working as well? Mm -hmm. And what I believe is happening is that evolutionarily, those cells are basically responding to a high energy environment. And they're saying, okay, there's a lot of 
there's a lot of fatty acids that are coming in here. They exceed my ability to oxidize this energy. And now I have excess energy inside of me. So I need to stop more energy from coming inside of me and limit the amount of stuff that comes inside the cell. So the easiest way to block more energy from coming inside of your liver and muscle is to literally not communicate with insulin because insulin is the most powerful anabolic hormone in your body. There's no other hormone in your body that is more powerful than insulin at promoting two things. Number one, cellular growth, and number two, fuel storage and uptake. So if you can basically just tell insulin that you're not interested in its effects and its signal, then what that means is that less fatty acids will come in, less glucose will come in, less amino acids will come in, and then you will be able to protect yourself against stuff that's in the blood that you don't necessarily want. So I think what these tissues do is they initiate this self-defense mechanism to basically say, Hey, hold on. I don't want more energy. Let's not do this right now. And as a result of that, the net result is that when you're eating a high fat diet and you're causing a net accumulation of lipid inside of your liver and muscle, then in that state, when you try and consume anything that's carbohydrate rich, right? Like a banana, it could be a potato. It could be black beans. It could be quinoa. It could be a piece of bread. It could be a cracker right? If you consume carbohydrate rich food, then the carbohydrates get broken down into glucose. Glucose gets in your blood and glucose tries to find a home. And glucose also wants to get inside of your liver and muscle. Insulin comes and knocks on the door and goes, Hey, knock, knock liver, knock, knock muscle. There's some glucose in the blood. Do you want to take it up? And both of those tissues respond by saying, Hey, by the way, I'm not paying attention to you right now. Cause I got a bunch of stuff inside of the, inside of me right now that I gotta, I gotta get rid of. So why don't you stay outside? You do your thing. I'm going to, I'm going to oxidize this fatty acids first. And then when I'm done oxidizing these fatty acids, you can then enter. So what that does is it causes a traffic jam of both insulin and glucose inside of your blood. And you end up with a net accumulation of glucose in your blood and a net accumulation of insulin in your blood, causing what's called hyperinsulinemia and hyperglycemia simultaneously. Mm. So that's the mechanism that, that is at play that can get disrupted and change significantly when you lower your fat content dramatically. Yeah, I think you um, explained that beautifully and it totally makes sense. The one thing that I'm also curious to know a little bit more about is, I guess, like the composition of the, the fat intake. So like I know you mentioned you're specifically emphasizing you know, saturated fat intake, blocking this cellular uptake of glucose. Does the same also occur with monounsaturated fats and also polyunsaturated fats? Okay, great question. So we actually wrote about this in our book, Mastering Diabetes because this question comes up a lot about, well, why saturated fat, you know, are unsaturated fatty acids any better? Is there like a threshold for how much of those you can eat? And what the research actually shows is that if you are consuming a significant amount of saturated fat on a daily basis, like let's go backwards to what I said. I said, I was eating 42% of my calories as fat and a significant amount of that came as saturated fat. So 42% of my calories were saturated fat that came from animal sources and approximately 70 to 80% of that came from saturated fat. And then the remainder 20 to 30 came from unsaturated fat. Okay. So on a per gram basis, I don't remember the actual numbers, but I was probably consuming anywhere between 15 and 20 grams of saturated fat per day on average. Right. Okay. So the research indicates that if you take a high saturated fat intake and you simply substitute those saturated fat sources for unsaturated fat sources, either for MUFAs or PUFAs, the monounsaturated and polyunsaturated, that right there will improve insulin sensitivity right off the bat. So you don't change your total fat intake. Don't change your carbohydrate intake. Don't change your protein intake. Just eat less saturated fat and more unsaturated fat. Improvement in insulin sensitivity very quickly. Okay. And that's a good thing. The, the, the magnitude of change of insulin sensitivity that you'll see in that scenario is probably something on the order of like 30 to 40%, meaning insulin will become 30 to 40% more effective. Awesome. Not a problem at all. But then if you go take it one step beyond that, and not only do you make this change from saturated to unsaturated, okay, predominantly, but you then also lower your total fat intake from 42% down to 15%, which is what I recommend. If you make that change, then you will de facto significantly improve your insulin sensitivity yet again. But this time, instead of getting a 30 to 40% improvement in insulin sensitivity, you'll get like a 300 to 500% improvement in insulin sensitivity. And that's the thing that I think most people are unaware of is that, yeah, the switch from saturated to unsaturated is definitely effective. And you can see that in the research, 
but significantly lowering your fat intake is going to give you a much larger magnitude of change. And that right there is going to enable insulin from becoming a relatively ineffective signaling molecule to a highly effective signaling molecule, which can then promote a bunch of glucose uptake into all tissues. Hmm. Something that actually came up in my mind, Cyrus, is in relation to, I guess, the another potential pathway. I'm not sure if you've explored it in depth, but that is like the influence of these plant-based nutrients and plant-based antioxidants, flavonoids, and these mod biotics and probiotics and prebiotics, how they affect the microbiome. Because obviously we're understanding more about how the microbiome can affect peripheral insulin sensitivity and things like that. Yeah. Let's dive deep into that. Like what, what do we know about, you know, how that can affect that pathway? Yeah. I'm very glad you taught you you're asking this because I was just doing a bunch of research not too long ago about how the microbiome plays a central role in the metabolism of fiber and the creation of short chain fatty acids that can then go out to act as signaling molecules to other tissues. So from what I understand, the story goes here, you as an individual cannot break down fiber. Okay. You don't possess the enzymatic machinery to do it. Neither do I, neither do mammals. We just don't make it. It's called cellulase. They're cellulases, different types of enzymes that are specifically designed to cut the bond between the glucose molecules that make up fiber. So what's fascinating is that what most people don't recognize is that when you eat potato, you eat, which is a starchy food, what you're primarily eating is long chains of glucose. Literally the glucose is either linear or it's in a branch chain structure. And the glucose is linked by what's called alpha glycosidic bonds, which are basically a particular type of bond that just links glucose molecule to glucose molecule. Every single bond is alpha glycosidic period end of story. Now, Fiber is the exact same structure, but instead of being an alpha glycosidic bond, it's a beta glycosidic bond. And that one tiny structural change of changing the way that the bond is constructed makes it so that you cannot utilize a single bit of that glucose for energy. It's done. You do not make the machinery, the enzymatic, you know, the enzymes to be able to cut that beta glycosidic bond. And as a result of that, that's it. So it's not food for you. It's not going to yield glucose that you can utilize for energy. So what ends up happening is that that fiber ends up going further down your digestive tract from your small intestine to your large intestine. And inside of your large intestine, you have your microbiome. You have literally 38 trillion bacteria whose job it is, is to feast on the partially digested food that made it that far, right? And so if there's a lot of fibrous material in there, then the bacteria that are present inside of your microbiome are going, the ones that can consume, the ones that manufacture the cellulase enzyme to cut the beta glycosidic bond are the ones that are going to get a lot of food. And they're the ones that are going to be like, sweet, it's Christmas. I got a bunch of glucose coming in. Sounds like a plan. They'll take up that glucose. They will use it for energy. They will manufacture other compounds. And then they will also make replicas of themselves and they will proliferate, AKA colonize your gut right? So if you feed a lot of fibrous material before you know it, now you're changing the composition of the microbiome and you're going to a microbiome that can manufacture more bacteria that like fiber. It's just that simple, right? In addition to that, your point is that you're also getting other micronutrients along for the ride. You're getting vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and phytochemicals. Okay. So these are all very, very, very important micronutrients that come along for the ride. Some of those micronutrients are absorbed via your digestive tract up in your small intestine, and they're absorbed into your blood and they're transported to tissues directly. But some of them also end up traveling farther down to your large intestine where they can also interact with your microbiome and they can provide nutrients, micronutrients for your microbiome, for the bacteria in your microbiome. Okay? And that's a good thing because the vitamins and minerals and antioxidants that are helpful for you are also helpful for your microbiome. Okay. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Your microbiome, again, 38 trillion, 40 trillion at best estimate bacteria, which is an absurd number, absolutely absurd number. I actually did the, I did the math on this the other day and it blew my mind. If you had $1 bills and you had 40 trillion of them and you tried to put them into a bunch of semi trucks, like 18 wheel trucks, guess how many 18 wheel trucks you'd have to fill for $40 trillion. Jeez. Oh. Um, you're putting me on the spot here. Probably I'd yeah. say, I don't know, maybe. Hmm. Is it, I'll give you a couple of answers or options. It's either a uh, thousand, 10,000, 
a hundred thousand uh or one million or two million uh like one million or yeah it's 1.75 million yeah, okay. right somewhere closer to two million right it, it's a lot of trucks right meaning it's a big number so point being is that you have a bunch of these bacteria and you want to make them as happy as possible because the diversity of your microbiome is one of the most important determinants of your optimal health of humans optimal health right so long story short these micronutrients come along for the ride along with the fiber we talked about the fact that they metabolize the fiber they uptake the glucose then they manufacture what are called postbiotic material the fiber is the prebiotic material you probably know all this like the back of your hand the postbiotic material which they secrete compounds that they manufacture and use for themselves or pass to the colon or put back in the blood to be circulated to other tissues. The primary compounds that they make that are very beneficial for human health are called short chain fatty acids, SCFAs. These short chain fatty acids are some of the most incredible compounds that you know I've ever read about. They're like the Santa Clauses of the biological world, right? So you start to manufacture a collection of short chain fatty acids, which either comes in as butyrate, propionate, or uh, missing one of them. What's acetate. the third one? Acetate. acetate. Thank yeah. you. That's right. Butyrate, propionate, and acetate. And these bad boys are so powerful that they, they have effects on practically all tissues. They have effect on your pancreas, on your liver, on your brain, on your heart, on your vasculature, on your colon. And, you know, we could do a long talk about what do they do in your colon versus what do they do in your vasculature versus what do they do in your pancreas. As far as blood glucose is concerned, they help lower blood glucose by stimulating glucose uptake inside of muscle and inside of liver, right? And partially helping to reverse this insulin resistance physiology. They also knock on the door of your pancreas and they tell your, the pancreas to either secrete a little bit more insulin or a little bit less insulin, depending on what the needs of the tissues are. They also tell your, the, the alpha cells inside of your eyelets and your pancreas to lower the amount of glucagon that they're producing, which is good because then that forces your liver to produce a little bit less glucose. And as a result of that, these short chain fatty acids can help lower blood glucose. And that's a good thing for you. Yeah. Inside of your colon, short chain fatty acid production can also help, you know, optimize colon health and lower the risk for colon cancer inside of your brain. They can actually improve cognition and the list goes on. I'm jumping, jumping topics a little bit, but I'm getting too excited learning more about the mechanisms here, but let's go back to normal physiology. Let's look at like just a normal individual. We know there are various hormones that can stimulate or increase blood sugar. So adrenaline, maybe yeah. epinephrine can also play a role, other hormones, but I'd like to learn more about like what else can actually influence or lower blood glucose. What other hormones or factors can play a role here? For sure. For sure. It's a, it's a phenomenal question because there are hormonal drivers of increased glucose, yeah. right? So in other words, what are hormones that you manufacture that can increase your blood glucose? And like you said, you hit on the head, adrenaline slash epinephrine from your adrenal gland. That is a very, very powerful way to rise to, to increase your blood glucose. Number two, cortisol, the quote unquote stress hormone that's released by the, the adrenal cortex. That is a very powerful blood glucose increaser. Number three, glucagon from the alpha cells inside of your pancreas. That is another way to go to your liver to knock on the door and say, Hey, put glucose in the blood now. And that causes your blood glucose to rise. So all three of those are, are very powerful at getting your blood glucose to rise. And they're there for very good reason. They're there in emergency situations. They're there to protect you against hypoglycemia. They're there in case your carbohydrate intake is so low that you have to stimulate glucose production from your liver to protect your brain from starvation. This is fascinating stuff. But the question is, what can you do besides insulin to lower your glucose? So number one, limit your saturated fat intake like we talked about. That will significantly reduce your blood glucose values because it allows glucose to enter your liver and muscle in larger quantities. So it forces what's called more glucose uptake into your liver and muscle. Number two, insulin will do the trick. No question. Insulin is the most powerful thing that you can possibly do. Number three, exercise of any shape or form. Okay. There's two primary types of exercise. There's cardiovascular and resistance-based exercise. We don't have to nerd out on exactly what type and how much and what intensity we can do an entire another conversation on that at some point, no problem. But what's really important is that if people move their body for a minimum of 30 minutes, somewhere between 30 and 60 minutes per day, they get their heart rate elevated. And if they can get some resistance movements in to force muscle contraction, that goes a long way in telling your muscle tissue to allow more glucose to enter. 
So you can think of it as a way where you're stimulating your muscle tissue to get really excited about glucose as a fuel. So what happens during exercise is that the onboard storage of glucose that it holds inside of itself called glycogen starts to get broken down. And that's a good thing because it's an internal storage tank that starts to become a little bit depleted. So during exercise, you deplete glycogen. You also deplete your fatty acid reserves and you kind of lower the tanks on both of those. And then after exercise, your muscles are like, Hey, could you put more glucose inside of me? I need to refill that tank. I need to put more stuff in that glycogen tank. So then that's an opportunity for you to eat carbohydrate rich foods that come from whole sources, not refined crap, but whole sources. And when you do that, then the glucose actually gets inside of your muscle tissue using a very small amount of insulin. And that's a good thing for you. Okay. Exercise is extremely powerful. Number four, stress, 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 stress. Like we talked about cortisol is a very powerful blood glucose, whatever you want to call it, it cause your blood glucose to go up. If you can lower your stress levels, and I mean, intentionally lower your stress levels via some type of meditation practice, some type of mindfulness practice, some type of deep breathing practice, and or getting adequate amounts of sleep, that's going to have a profound influence on your blood glucose values and to keep them nice and low. And that's a really good thing. That's going to keep your blood glucose nice and low on a 24 hour basis. And the final thing I'll say is that when you perform intermittent fasting, intermittent fasting is a very powerful technique that can reduce your total calorie intake, cut off, literally cut off the supply of amino acids and fatty acids and glucose simultaneously. And that forces your liver and muscle to go internal and start to oxidize the fuels they already have on board. So they start to break down glycogen. They start to break down their triglyceride molecules. And as a result of that, those tissues become hungry. And if you can extend that fast for 16 hours or 24 hours, or maybe even a little bit longer, then those tissues are like, yes, this is what I'm looking for. Now put more fuel into me. And when you put more fuel in, you can put more fuel in for very small amounts of insulin. Hmm. So all of those are simple ways that you can do it. Awesome. Just out of curiosity, I know you mentioned like one of the most potent interventions would be to reduce total saturated fat intake. Obviously, I'm sure you've had this question asked numerous times is around like coconut oil being a saturated fat, but is it a different type of saturated fat that gets processed differently? Maybe do you want to explain that to my audience? For sure. It's a great question because coconut oil has become pretty popular in the world of, uh, especially in the world of like the ketogenic diet. So the saturated fat that you get from coconuts is slightly different than the saturated fat you might find in chicken or meat or fish. And the reason for that is because the chain length is just a little bit shorter. Okay. So rather than being a 16 carbon or 18 carbon length fatty acid chain, the fatty acids are like 12 to 14 carbons long. And as a result of that, they're instead of being considered long chain fatty acids, LCFAs, they're considered MCFAs, which are called medium chain fatty acids. Yes. And just that difference in like a couple of carbon here and three carbon or four carbons here and two carbons here makes a massive difference because those saturated fat molecules are now have a slightly different structure. And as a result of that, they're going to have a little bit of a different function. But what's important to understand is that the chain length matters, but the reduction in chain length doesn't reduce the effect of insulin resistance. In other words, consuming saturated fat from coconut will still create an insulin resistant state, right? So that the medium chain fatty acids, I'm trying to remember the exact physiology and you can help me out on this. I believe that they actually become fuel for your small intestine, if I'm not mistaken, and, or for the epithelial cells inside of your large intestine. I'm not hundred percent certain. Maybe I think like, isn't the C8 that's the one that's like highly revered. That's the one that they're trying to extract coconut oil. So it's like mostly the C8 because it gets better utilized to get converted into ketones or something. That's what I thought. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. So there could be a physiology there that I just can't remember myself, but I think that the most important thing to talk about here is, is coconut oil safe from a diabetes perspective or from a blood glucose perspective? And From what we know, the answer is no, it's not because it's still going to cause a very similar problem that the longer chain fatty acids had in causing a net accumulation of fatty acids inside of your liver and inside of your muscle. And that's going to contribute to the insulin resistant physiology. Yeah. Now let's look at carbohydrate sources because I'm someone who's like, I'm pretty liberal in terms of my carbohydrate intake. I play around with different types of carbohydrates, mostly fruits, never fruit juice. Obviously I'm 
don't drink like pure fruit juice, things like that. I'm consuming oats, you know, quinoa, brown rice, honey, maple syrup, all that sort of widespread variety. Let's look at some favorable, or maybe let's look at maybe, because I'd imagine you've probably worn like a CGM device and run yeah. experiments. I'd love to learn more about some of your experiments that you've seen with certain foods. Like what have you found maybe some certain carbohydrates that you respond really well to versus others that you actually don't respond well to? It's a great question because as you know, not all carbohydrate energy is created equal, right? There's different types of fiber inside of each different type of carbohydrate rich food. And some types of carbohydrate are more refined than others. So before we get too deep into individual foods, let's just like take all carbohydrate and break it down into like different classes. So what I think the general public does too often that kind of like frustrates me a little bit, (laughs) I'll be very clear about this, is it takes all carbohydrate energy and lumps it into one category and says, carbs are bad for you. Carbs will make you fat. Carbs will make your pancreas spike your insulin production and it's going to be bad for you and you're going to become more diabetic. But it's frustrating because there are two classes. There are two groups of carbohydrate. Number one, whole carbohydrate, fruits, legumes, starchy vegetables, and whole grains. Okay. That is class number one. Class number two is refined carbohydrate, cookies, crackers, chips, pastas, sodas, pastries, uh, you know, brownies, waffles, you name it, stuff that comes in packages that you find primarily in the middle of the grocery store that had to go through some kind of ridiculous manufacturing process in order to taste good and become edible. Okay. I do not recommend eating any of those refined carbohydrate rich foods. And I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think you're going to tell people to be eating those foods. And I don't think there's any health expert. I don't care what field you come from. You could be in ketogenic, you could be a carnivore, you could be a vegan, you could be anything nobody I know is saying, go eat more refined carbohydrate energy, right? Zero. Okay. So if we can just take those carbohydrates and literally draw a giant red X on top of them and put them in the trash can and not even talk about them. Okay. Those forms of carbohydrate rich foods are manufactured, highly palatable, very low fiber content, very low micronutrient content, And they have been shown in plenty of uh, evidence-based research to number one, stimulate your appetite to eat more than you normally would. Number two, cause your liver to do things that are very deleterious to, you know, blood glucose control. They're going to increase insulin resistance inside of your liver and cause your liver to literally manufacture more glucose on a daily basis. None of those is good for you. So we're throwing the trash can. The question really becomes when we're looking at the whole carbohydrates, the fruits, the starchy vegetables, the legumes, and the whole grains are certain ones better than others. And my short answer is eat them all, literally just eat them all, right? Whether you're eating papayas or bananas or pineapple or berries, I don't care. Eat them all because all fruits are going to be very helpful for you. In addition to that, all forms of legumes, beans, peas, lentils, okay? Garbanzo beans, black beans, green lentils, red lentils, green peas, sugar snap peas. I mean, you name it. We could do an entire podcast about just the legume category. Those bad boys are very nutrient dense, very good for you. And then the whole grains are not the white processed breads, but the amaranth and the quinoa and the spelt and the buckwheat and the, um, the barleys and the millets of the world. Those are the foods that are considered whole with minimal refining process. Those are all good. Okay. But I'm giving you the blanket recommendation to go ahead and eat as much of that material as possible. But you probably have seen this in, you know, your listeners and your patients, I've seen it as well. And I've also experienced it, which is if I eat a bowl of chickpeas that has, let's say it's got chickpeas and mango and cilantro and tomatoes inside of it, I could eat that bowl and I could give myself two units of insulin and I could take on something of the order of hundred grams of carbohydrate. Okay. Two units of insulin for hundred grams of carbohydrate. You know, I eat that. My glucose is very well controlled seen it on a CGM. I've seen it on a blood glucose meter. It doesn't go anything higher than 125 comes right back down. We're in great control. Okay. Yep. But I could do that exact same thing. And I could just pull out the chickpeas and I could put in the exact same quantity of white cannellini beans. Okay. White cannellini beans. And those are very tasty, different texture, slightly different type of fiber inside of them, still eating the same amount of them. And I'll eat that. And my blood glucose will go higher. 
Was, is, there, is there more or less fiber in the white cannellini beans? Uh, that I don't know. That is a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, but what I have observed over the course of time is that let's say we put, you know, 20 different types of beans on the table. We had cannellini beans. We had navy beans. We had black beans. We had red beans. We had pinto beans. We had chickpeas and beyond. And we could do the same experiment where you're eating, let's say, 100 grams of each one of them you're likely to get a slightly different blood glucose response from every single one of them because those beans have a slightly different fiber content. They have a slightly different micronutrient content. They interact with your microbiome in slightly different ways. Yeah. Your microbiome might be very used to consuming chickpeas because you have the enzymes to break down those carbohydrates, but you know they may not be used to navy beans. So when you consume the navy beans, all of a sudden you might get bloated and or your glucose might do weird things, right? So my point is that there's a certain amount of experimentation which has to happen for each individual. And rather than you trying out a bunch of plant rich material and then being like, Cyrus, come on, Lucas, come on. Now I tried that, you know, bean salad and now I'm farting all the time and I'm bloated and I feel very uncomfortable. I guess I just can't eat legumes. The answer is no, 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 no. You might have eaten one particular legume that your microbiome is not accustomed to. You're probably going to want to eat in smaller quantities and increase over the course of time and just do it more slowly. That's my sort of basic point here. Yeah. It makes me reconsider the name of this podcast, perhaps like retitle it the anti-Navy bean podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Poop happens. The anti-Navy bean. (laughs) I like that. So Cyrus, I guess like to sort of wrap things up, um, I'd love to hear about like what you think the future of medicine holds as far as like, I would love to hear about like what direction would you like to see medicine go in or like what areas of research are you excited to see more, more data on in the like diabetes and metabolic health space? Yeah. I want you to answer that question when I'm done too, because sure. I'm very interested in your, your intake on this. Here's the direction that I would love to see. You probably know this better than anybody. Doctors love to prescribe medication. You go to a doctor, a typical allopathic doctor and say, Hey, you know, I got like gastric reflux, right. Or I, my A1C is slightly elevated. I have prediabetes. And the first thing they'll do is they'll reach for like Prilosec OTC and be like, Hey, you need a PPI, right. Or you might go to, you know, blood glucose is slightly elevated. They might give you metformin. And now all of a sudden you're sort of hooked on more pharmaceutical medication. Doctors are not bad people. They're wonderful human beings. They're very altruistic. They just haven't been given the tools to understand diet properly. So let's teach doctors how to use diet and food as their primary weapon of choice, if you will, right? If the doctors are the ones that have that knowledge, then the doctors are the ones that can teach their patients. That's going to have a ripple effect on society. And it's going to get more people into this idea that like the food I eat matters. And the food I eat isn't just a thing that I'm putting in my body to make my tongue happy. It's a thing I'm putting in my body to actually lower my risk for chronic disease, whether that's prediabetes, type two diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, cognitive decline, fatty liver disease, the chronic kidney disease, and the list goes on. Right. So I would love to see that change. And I know it's starting to change slowly, but I kind of want to put some gas on that fire because doctors are the conduit to the healthcare system. They're the conduit to millions of people in the United States and beyond. And they have a very authoritative role in society. And if we empower our doctors to have more knowledge when it comes to nutrition, it's a win-win situation for everyone, right? The pharmaceutical companies may not be happy about that, but you know, last time I checked, I don't really care about what the pharmaceutical companies think, right? Yeah. Your turn, you go. Yeah, I'll definitely, I'd like to mirror that. I'd like to also say, I'd love to see more research. I'd love to see more emphasis placed on that preventative medicine aspect, in particular for those like, Particularly med school students, like from what I've heard is that they spend very, very little time on nutrition. So I'd love to see that. But then for me, I mean, I would love to see more research on the psychobiotic space. Like I'm really, I love learning about like how specific bacteria can affect like very specific uh, elements associated with mood states and specifically like different forms of like social anxiety or perhaps even like anhedonia, things like that. So I'm really excited to see more research on like specifically that psychobiotic space that that really excites me. So you're saying that there's particular foods which have an effect on your microbiome, which then can affect 
your emotional state. Yes. Um, and it's like, it's measurable and it's repeatable. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like there's specific um, bacteria that we know, like specific types of lactobacillus bacteria that have like been studied. I know they've actually isolated it and actually administered that particular bacteria to assess the effect in humans, like how that would affect mood. That for me is like, wow. Like that is really targeted, really like sniper rifle approach. For me, that's like a really exciting space to see more research on. Heck yeah. I would love it. I'm actually very interested in that myself because one of the things, like if we sort of tie this back into blood glucose control, we talk about blood glucose control as basically being affecting two tissues, your liver and your muscle. If you can control the physiology of your liver and muscle, you can control your blood glucose today and you can prevent your pancreas from becoming dysfunctional over the course of time, which will preserve your life and prevent you from transitioning towards type two diabetes. There's no question about it. Right. Mm. But beyond your liver and muscle over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been this explosion of research about your brain and your brain is affected by your blood glucose levels. But more importantly, your brain is also affected by your saturated fat intake. And you can actually induce a state of insulin resistance inside of your brain. So it's central nervous system, insulin resistance, which affects your brain chemistry and actually can promote or accelerate the rate of uh, cognitive decline into the future. So now they're literally referring to vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease as being type three diabetes, literally insulin resistance of your brain. And when I read that, I was like, oh my, it makes so much sense, but there's a whole, there's a whole world, there's a whole universe of biochemistry that happens in your brain, which is different than what happens inside of your liver and muscle. That is in my opinion, a very exciting frontier so that people can really understand how they can protect their brain against a future decline. Yeah. Even on that as well, I think I saw research on like excess saturated fat affecting BDNF production in the brain. I think this was, a totally. maybe, yeah, which is um, pretty interesting, but Cyrus, this has been a really fun chat. I knew it was going to be, we're going to geek out in today's yeah. session. <laughs> Do you want to let my listeners know a little bit more about where they can find you, your books and further reach out to explore more of your content? For sure. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. We wrote a book. It's a New York Times bestselling book that was released just before the pandemic in the, uh, was it February of 2020. It's called Mastering Diabetes. Just go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble, type in Mastering Diabetes and you'll see it. That book, if you're interested in learning more about diabetes, about the physiology that I was explaining, and then actually putting together an action plan for yourself that will help you lower your blood glucose and significantly reduce your overall chronic disease risk, then I highly recommend picking up that book. Obviously, but I'm jaded, but you know, I think it's a good book. <laughs> so that's where I would start. The paperback version of that book is actually coming out on October 18th, 2022. And we're very excited about that paperback book because it's, uh, you know, people are going to go, you know, it's, it's another option of people to buy either the hardback or the paperback book. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of excitement about it, we hope. In addition to that, we also have coaching programs and the coaching program is literally us holding your hand in either an individual format or a group format. And we show you how to make the transition towards a plant-based diet. And I'm biased one more time, but I think we're very, very, very good at what we do. And we've helped thousands of people. I mean, at last count, it was literally over 10,000 people transition to a plant-based lifestyle and make significant improvements and lowering their A1C, lowering their blood glucose, lowering their blood pressure, lowering their cholesterol value, losing weight. And the best part is that our program teaches you habits that you maintain for years. So I don't care about yo-yo dieting. I don't care about your A1C coming down and then popping back up six months from now. I'm done with that. We teach long-term habits that also have profound short-term effects. So if you're interested in doing that, come to our website, masteringdiabetes.org. Just go there. That's the gateway to learning about everything that we do. And uh, that's how you can kind of get involved in the ecosystem. Awesome. I'll make sure to leave those linked in the show notes for those listening in. But uh, yeah, Cyrus, uh, thanks for coming on the show. It was a pleasure, pleasure chatting. Awesome. I appreciate you having me here and uh, I appreciate what you do. And, and I appreciate you really reaching out to help people understand how they can transform their health in ways that are within their control. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining in to today's episode. For in-depth show notes and lessons learned, visit nofilter.media forward slash boost your biology. This has been a No Filter Media production. Say what you want.